And don't you just love that bumper music that brings us into a, yet another exciting program that we're calling the 11th Hour Edition. We're coming to you live from Battle Creek, Michigan. My name's Pastor Jason. I'm your host. And I'm so excited about the messages that Pastor Ashrick has been bringing us night by night. How about you folks? Would you say amen? amen. Okay, now, you know, this is a 3 ABN audience out there. So let's say amen really loud. Ready? Amen. amen. Praise the Lord. God has been good and he's been lifting himself up. One of the things that I've experienced is a new persuasion that Jesus Christ is alive and that he loves me. How about you? Amen. And tonight, Buddy Hotelling is standing by right now with a beautiful version of the song, I Am Persuaded, taken from Romans chapter 8. I understand it. Buddy, take it away. ever keep my father from me I am persuaded that there's no angel no principality that could separate me from my God above or his love in Jesus Christ I am persuaded that I'm his child and he'll love me for the rest of my life Persuaded that there's no power, nothing present, nothing to come. I am persuaded, no height, no depth, no creature, not anyone that could separate me from my God above and his love in Jesus Christ. I am persuaded that I'm his child. And he'll love me for the rest of my life Sometimes I feel I'm more than a conqueror But even when I'm at my weakest Of one thing I am sure I am persuaded that death no life Could ever keep my father from me I am persuaded that there's no angel, no principality that could separate me from my God above and his love in Jesus Christ. I am persuaded that I'm his child and he'll love me for the rest of my life. And he'll love me for the rest of my life. Brother, you may be persuaded, but I agree with you tonight. Jesus Christ is a God that you can trust and be a friend of. I see Pastor Ashrick is making his way up here right now, and he's got a load of information for you tonight. I want to take you for just a moment, though, back in time to the day when our beloved commander, Jesus Christ, was standing with his angel friends, looking at them. I suppose that tears were running down their faces as they put their arms around him for what was going to be the last time in a very long time. And then one of the angels flew swiftly to a little girl, a young maiden in, in the area around, around uh, Galilee in the town of Nazareth, a lady named Mary, and said, It's in your hands now, Mary. Do you want to see the Messiah come into the world through your, through your womb? And when she said, Be it unto me according to thy will, another angel pacing outside, an angel who used to be known as Lucifer, knew exactly what had happened in heaven. Jesus had stepped into the glory of his father, I suppose, and disappeared and was now in the womb of Mary, coming into this world. For what purpose? For what purpose, my friends? To go to the cross. Why did he do it? What does the cross mean? Pastor Ashrick has answers tonight. Pastor Ashrick, God bless you. Amen. Good evening, everyone. Wasn't that a beautiful song? Thank you. I tell you, thank you, buddy. For, is that your son? He's beautiful. How'd that happen? <laughs> oh, he's beautiful. Thank you for singing. 
Wasn't that, a, wasn't that a wonderful introduction? I was really, I felt like I was right there in heaven just before Jesus left to come to this planet. Well, our message tonight is the first in a two-part series entitled, The Cross, the Fulcrum of the Ages. The Cross, the Fulcrum of the Ages. Tonight is part one, and then we will be back on Sunday for part two. I will take two nights off, and actually we'll make a quick flight down to Florida, and then a quick flight back. And if I don't make it, Pastor Jason Siever will do what he can do. And uh, in my absence, he'll pick up the baton. Of course, I'm, I'm, I'm imagining that he's hoping that doesn't happen. That's my hunch. <laughs> he's praying that my plane, uh, uh, not that it goes down, of course, but that it uh, uh, gets delayed. Well, let's begin with a, wee, a word of prayer, and then we'll get right into our message proper this evening. <clears throat> Father in heaven, as we gather tonight, we are persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Father, tonight, as we begin to unfold that love, as we begin to try and understand it from a universal perspective, Father, I pray that your spirit will be with us in a powerful way. Lord, tonight, as we begin this two-part series on the cross, I pray that you will loose my lips so that I may speak in a powerful, compelling, and persuasive way. Father in heaven, you said to Moses many years ago, who made man's mouth? And surely, Father, if you could speak to the mouth of Moses, you can speak to the mouth of David. And so, Father, I pray you will be with us tonight, and that your word will come across, and that your Son will be glorified and uplifted in this room. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't you open your Bibles with me to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. So many times when we seek to understand the cross and its significance, we see it from what I consider to be a rather myopic point of view. That is to say we see it from one perspective and oftentimes a limited perspective. We see the cross simply from our point of reference, our point of view, and we see it as, as that place where Jesus saved us from our sins. And so we say, on the cross, Jesus paid for my sins. And is that true, yes or no? It's abundantly true. That is, that is one of the great cornerstones of the Christian faith. What we're going to try to do in the next two meetings is to understand the cross not only from the perspective of you and I, that is to say sinners saved by grace, we're going to try to take a larger, universal look at the cross. How does the cross look to the unfallen angels and to the unfallen worlds who have not had an experiential um, uh, attachment and intimacy with sin? And so this will begin a two-part series entitled The Cross, the Fulcrum of the Ages. And we're going to begin in what some people might consider to be an unusual place, and that's Revelation chapter 12. Now, what we're going to do is also maybe a little unusual. We're going to read Revelation chapter 12 through in its entirety so that we can have a broad sweep, a broad picture, what I call an airplane view of this great chapter. Many theologians consider Revelation chapter 12 to be the theological climax of the book of Revelation. And so we're going to take time and read through all 17 verses. I'll be reading. You follow along in your Bibles and try to get a picture in your mind of the vivid imagery and of the powerful symbolism that is used in this chapter. We will then come back and we will divide this chapter into five main elements and then we will progress from there. Let's begin in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 1. Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet and on her head a garland of twelve stars. Verse 2, then being with child, she cried out in labor and pain to give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven, behold, a great fiery red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his heads. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to be devoured or who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. 
Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that he has a short time. Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. But the earth helped the woman and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. And the dragon was enraged with the woman and went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Powerful chapter, isn't it? The imagery in that chapter is just amazing. It's inescapably gripping. You have here these elements that are, that are so foreign to our natural experience, dragons and, and wars and, and wars in heaven. I mean, so many different things here that are foreign almost to the way that we see reality. Yet here's John, the last living apostle, there 24 miles out into the Aegean Sea, and with an aged hand he is scribbling down on papyrus these words, these visions that Jesus was revealing to him. And you might be asking as we commence this evening, what does Revelation chapter 12 have to do with the cross? Why would we begin there about a message concerning the cross? Well, what we'd like to do at this point is take Revelation chapter 12 and divide it into five main elements. Five main elements. The first element that we are introduced to in Revelation chapter 12 is the woman. It is what, everyone? The woman. Notice it there in verse 1. Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, and the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of 12 stars. So the first thing that John saw there in that vision was a woman. Well, what is a woman here? Is this a literal woman? The answer is no. In end time Bible prophecy, the book of Revelation, as well as in other places, a woman symbolizes the people of God. A woman symbolizes the people of God. Now listen very carefully. I purposely didn't say the word church there because a woman was also used in the Old Testament to symbolize the nation of Israel. And so the nation of Israel in the Old Testament symbolized by a woman and the people of God in the New Testament also symbolized by a woman. And so we avoid unnecessary confusion when we say the woman represents the people of God. Can you say amen to that? Now notice this incredible statement taken here from 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2, the Apostle Paul writing. Writing to the church at Corinth, he says, For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. For I have betrothed, the word means given or engaged. I have betrothed you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Paul here picks up on that analogy, that powerful analogy, that the relationship between a man and his wife between a husband and wife is a microcosm of the great relationship that Jesus Christ has with his church. If that makes sense to you, why don't you say amen? You can read all about it in Ephesians chapter 5 where the Apostle Paul says this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So the first thing that John sees there in this panoramic vision there from the island of Patmos is a woman, the people of God. Notice how she is clothed, how she is adorned with the sun and the moon and the stars, a garland of 12 stars on her head, clothed with the sun and standing on the moon. What do these three things have in common, the sun, the moon, and the stars? These are the things that God uses to bring light to this earth, the sun in the day and the moon and the stars at night. I believe that as John was writing these words, he had Isaiah chapter 60, beginning in verse 1 in his mind, Arise, shine, for thy light is come. And the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. Behold, darkness covers the earth and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee and his glory shall be seen upon thee. What is God communicating here about his church? That she will shine forth the light of the glory of God to a world steeped in darkness, depravity and sin. This is the first thing that John sees in his vision. What is the second element that we are introduced to? The answer is the wicked dragon. Notice that's the second element that we saw there. Revelation chapter 12. And verse 2, Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his heads. There need be no confusion about the identity of the dragon for John spells it out in very plain language in verse 9. Notice that with me. So the great dragon was cast out. That serpent of old called who, everyone? The devil and what's the next word? Satan, Satan, the adversary, who deceives how much of the world? 
the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. We spoke about that last evening and we talked about this Lucifer, this angel. How could it be that a bright, beautiful, glorious, perfect, resplendent being could degenerate into what you and I know today as the devil or Satan? Now, friends, in a sentence, what happened to Satan is that he was filled with pride. He was filled with what word did I say, everyone? Pride. And as Lucifer became filled with pride about his own glory and his own accomplishments and his own beauty, I remind you what is at the center of pride. P-R-I-D-E. The same that is at the center of sin. S-I-N. And friends, pride and sin are all about the same thing. Namely, me, me, me. Me And as Lucifer took his eyes off of the glory of God, off, to, off of the majesty and worthiness of God, and began to look in the mirror and think to himself, well, I'm looking quite nice myself, his, his focus switched and he became Satan who formerly had been bright, beautiful, and glorious Lucifer. Are you with me on this, yes or no? So, so repugnant was this creature, so terrible and contrasted was this change that John refers to him as a great fiery red dragon. Think about the contrast. A bright, beautiful, glorious, resplendently iridescent being degenerating into a depraved and debauched and disgusting, repulsive dragon, friends. It is a contrast that it is well for us to notice. Very important. As we continue, the next element that we are introduced to is the war. There is a great war, and I want you to notice that in verse 7. Revelation chapter 12, and notice with me verse 7. It says, And war broke out in Iraq. Is that what it says? War broke out in where? It's no surprise to you and I that war has broke out in Iraq. It's common to speak about war in the terrestrial realm, in the earthly realm. But friends, notice here. War is spoken about in the celestial realm, in the heavenly kingdom. War broke out where, everyone? In heaven. And Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. Now, the word war occurs only two times in Revelation chapter 12. And let me ask you a very simple question. Where did the war begin? In heaven. Now, let me ask you a second question. According to Revelation chapter 12, well, where will the war end? Notice with me verse 17. And the dragon was enraged with the woman and went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Note with me that the war that began in the celestial realms will be completed and will reach its climax and conclusion right here on planet Earth. Friends, this is a very important point that we note. There are many people that say today, oh, there is no devil, there is no personal evil being. But friends, I assure you that the very last one that would want you to be aware that there is a devil is the devil himself. He is the one who has invented these ridiculous caricatures, you know, a, a, a pointy tail and a pitchfork and these kinds of things. Absolutely ridiculous. And rational thinking people look at that and say, surely this is straight out of Greek or Roman mythology. Friends, all the while Satan is cloaking himself in a clandestine move to jump and to surprise the entire world, not as an angel of darkness, friends, but as an angel of what? Light. So the war broke out in heaven, but it will be finished on earth. And notice also number four here, the weapon. Number four is the weapon. Now, the word weapon does not occur in Revelation chapter 12, but the concept of the weapon is surely there. Notice it with me in verse 11. And they, that is the people of God, overcame him, that is Satan, by the blood of the Lamb. They overcame by what, everyone? By the blood of the Lamb. Where was the blood of the Lamb spilt? On the cross of Calvary. That's right. And notice the second element there in verse 11. And by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. Revelation's weapon, friends, is the cross of Jesus Christ. The weapon with which God will defeat Satan is not your resolve. It's not your will. It's not your commandment keeping, your moral uh, uh, leanings. The weapon with which God will defeat Satan finally, once and for all, is the weapon of the cross. We are going to talk more and more about that as we progress. And the last element that we are introduced to to round out the five is the winners. That is to say, those who gain the victory. We see them there in verse 11, loving not their lives to the death. And we see them in verse 17, the dragon was wroth. And so we divide Revelation chapter 12 neatly and nicely into these five elements. The woman, the wicked dragon, the war, the weapon that Christ uses to overcome Satan once and for all, and those who avail themselves of that weapon, namely the winners. And friends, do you know who the winners are? That is you and me. Can you say amen? amen? Brothers and sisters, you can be in that number when the saints go marching in. Now, what I'd like to do is for you to consider with me something very important. 
In the book of Genesis, this is the first book of the Bible, we find something very important. We find a perfect God in the first two chapters living in perfect communion with a perfect people. Let me repeat that. In Genesis 1 and 2, we find a perfect God in perfect communion with a perfect people. Where did that take place? What was the name of that location? Eden. That's exactly right. The Garden of Eden. Now, remarkably, when you move all the way through all 66 books of the Bible, you come to the last book of the Bible. What book is that, by the way? The book of Revelation. And in the last two chapters of the last book of the Bible, yet again, in Revelation 21 and 22, we find a perfect God in perfect communion with a perfect people. So the first two chapters are Eden, and the last two chapters of the Bible are Eden restored. Are you understanding, yes or no? Now, notice with me just a moment here as we sort of try and get our fingers wrapped around this. First book of the Bible, Genesis. Last book of the Bible, Revelation. And what we learn here is that the Bible itself suggests an Eden to Eden perspective. If you hold up your Bible just like that, on this cover there is Eden. On this cover there is Eden. The Eden to Eden perspective is not some construct that is forced upon the Bible. It is something that is given to us from the Bible itself. Now, notice something remarkable here. If we set the book of Genesis over here, and we set the book of Revelation over here, okay? Now, everything in between is the Bible. So what's over here, everyone? Genesis. And what's over here, everyone? Revelation. Now, notice this with me. The first two chapters of Genesis have a perfect God and perfect communion with a perfect people. The last two chapters of Revelation, a perfect God and perfect communion with a perfect people. Now, note with me here. If I was to take one step this direction... What chapter would I be in in Genesis? I, no, what chapter would I be in Genesis? I've gone from Genesis 1 and 2 into Genesis chapter. You've got it, brother. Genesis chapter 3. Now you say, well, what's the significance about Genesis chapter 3? Friends, listen very carefully. In Genesis chapter 3, we find Jesus Christ fighting the first battle with the serpent on planet Earth. That's Genesis 3. Now, follow me all the way through the canon of Scripture, and we come now to Revelation 21 and 22. Now, if I stepped this way one chapter, what chapter would I be in? 20. Revelation, what is it, Jason? 20. Chapter 20. Now, listen carefully. What is the significance, the theological significance of Revelation chapter 20? Chiefly this. It is the last battle that Jesus Christ fights with the serpent on planet Earth. Do you begin to see the picture, yes or no? Get it in your mind. On this end, Eden, move one chapter, first battle. On this end, Eden restored, move one chapter in, the last battle. And so these two great pillars act like bookmarks in between which the rest of the Bible, the rest of the canon can be fit and placed. Are you with me now, yes or no? So we say the Bible suggests an Eden to Eden perspective. That is to say, in the beginning, a perfect God in perfect communion with a perfect people. So too in Revelation, a perfect God in perfect communion with a perfect people. Many theologians have recognized this as something the Bible itself suggests. Secondarily, though, the Bible also implies a first battle and a last battle perspective. Are you with me on this, yes or no? It begins in Genesis 3 and it ends in Revelation chapter 20. Now let's put everything together before we progress even one moment further. We read through Revelation chapter 12 in its entirety, and you might be thinking, why? Why would we read through Revelation 12 in its entirety? And the answer is just this. Revelation chapter 12, more than any other chapter in the Bible, distills down for us this great cosmic conflict and battle between the forces of light and darkness and good and evil. If there was one chapter that you were going to pick out of the entire canon of the Bible and say, that's the chapter that shows the great battle, that's the chapter that shows the great controversy, you would pick Revelation 12. Now, what we see in Revelation chapter 12 in microcosm, that means small, we see in the entire record of Scripture in macrocosm. What we are going to do now is something that I think you will find absolutely amazing and very, very thrilling to your soul. We are going to take and trace six stages of victory, six stages of progress in this great cosmic conflict that began in Genesis 3, extends all the way down to Revelation 20, through six very distinct and distinguishable stages. This is a great battle, a great conflict. You have there Christ, and the dragon is making war with him and with his people, and we're going to trace this battle through and notice the centrality of the cross. The centrality of what word did I say, everyone? The cross. Notice again. We're wanting to understand the cross, but not just from our, our narrow myopic view. We tend to say, oh, the cross, that's where Jesus paid for my sins. Surely that's true, friends. But what does the cross mean for the angels? 
What does the cross mean for God Himself? And what will the cross mean for us throughout the ceaseless eternal ages when we are redeemed sinners? Friends, the cross is not just something that we say, well, that's where He forgave my sins. Surely that is true, but that is only one half of the coin. Let's try to set that cross in a larger, more powerful, and more holistic context as the very centerpiece of the great war between Satan and God, the great cosmic conflict. And friends, this is not a George Lucas film. This is reality. So let's begin then. The first stage that we find, we go to Genesis chapter 3. As we've already suggested, let us go there. Genesis chapter 3. Now to paint the picture here very quickly... In Genesis chapters 1 and 2, as we've already said, we find a perfect God in perfect communion with a perfect people. Everything was glorious and beautiful. The atmosphere was beautiful. The water was clean. The, the birds were flying overhead. And you just can let your imagination run wild with, which, with what Eden must have looked like. Now, Adam and Eve had been placed in this garden by God to tend it and to keep it and to take care of it. But in Genesis chapter 3, we are introduced to an element that is out of context, a discordant note in the beauty and harmony of Eden. Beginning in verse 1, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? He begins to insinuate doubt. To insinuate what word did I say? Are you sure that God said that? And friends, that's the same thing that the devil will do to you and I in this day and age. He'll say, now, I know you think that the Bible says that, but are you sure that God said that? And this is exactly how Satan works. He begins to insinuate subtly and cleverly his doubts. Notice verse 2. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said you shall not eat it, neither shall you touch it lest ye die. Verse 4, then the serpent said to the woman five words, ye will not surely die but God had said four words in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die four words and Satan here inserts a fifth does it change the meaning of the sentence yes or no oh friends these are antithetical statements now they are the exact opposite God had said ye shall surely die Satan had said ye shall not surely die and I asked you the question last night and I repeat it again which one do you think would be more pleasing to the heart and to the ears of Eve the first or the second the second, and as we discussed last night, Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Friends, we are so prone to deception because our heart actually wants to be deceived. Amen. Now notice what happens here in verse 5. For God knows that in, that in the day you, you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was desirable to make one wise. She took of the fruit and ate. She gave also to her husband with her and he ate. I emphasize the word saw there because the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, we walk by faith, not by sight. What is the woman walking by? Faith in God's word or what she saw? What she saw. And I remind you again of what we discussed last night, friends, when there are great signs and miracles and wonders that will be permeating and saturating the land, many people will be walking by what they see and not by what the Word of God says. Amen. And they will be committing the same folly that was committed there in Eden when Eve chose to stand on what her eyes told her, what her senses told her, and not on a plane, thus saith the Lord. Verse 7, Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and they made themselves coverings. And they heard, this is one of the most tragic verses in all of the Bible, certainly, verse 8, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves. Friends, note those two words very carefully. They hid themselves from the presence. It says of the Lord God, but let me insert a word here that will make it even more poignant. They hid themselves from the presence of their father. Now, I have a son. I have two sons, as a matter of fact. And my oldest son, three years old, I, he's almost three. I just love him very much. He's, he is so dear to me, so close to my heart. He's just as wild and energetic as I am. And I tell you, when I come walking into the house, right now I'm away, with him, away from him because he's in California where my wife is watching her sister give birth. Now, listen carefully. When I, when I get to see my boy after being away for two weeks, when he sees me, I can tell you how he responds. At the top of his lungs, he says, Papa! And he comes running, and he runs just like me. You know, my friends joke that I run like a bear. And he, my son will come, Papa! And he'll run right up to me, and he'll hug me, and I'll throw my arms around him, throw him in the air, and we'll wrestle together. You can just imagine what it's like between me and my son. Now, let me tell you what would be devastating for the heart of a father. If I come and I say, Landon! And he turns the other direction 
and in fear and trepidation and uncertainty, he runs the opposite direction, not in joking, not in play make-believe, but he's running the other direction because he's terrified of me. You think that would break the heart of a father? Amen. Friends, what was happening there when Adam and Eve ran from the presence, they hid from the presence of the Lord, a relationship had been fractured. They had effectively changed their loyalty from the side of their creator and father to the side of the enemy, Satan. It was as though before they had their arms around the Lord, they had their arms around their father, but now that they have transgressed and they have heeded the words of Satan over the words of God, they have now effectively changed loyalties. Are you understanding, yes or no? So when God comes walking into the garden, instead of finding His children running to Him to tell them of the exploits and glories of the day, they fi He finds them running away in fear and trepidation. The heart of God was broken, friends. Amen. Now note with me, God then asks Adam three questions. Where art thou? Who told you that you were naked? And have you eaten of the tree? He blames it on the woman. The woman that thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. And then He asks Eve just one question. Woman, what is this that thou hast done? And then he turns and he preaches a serpent or a sermon to the serpent. Adam gets three questions. Eve gets one. But the serpent gets no questions because he knew better. He had stood in the very presence of the throne of God. So notice, let's note that sermon in verse 14 of Genesis 3. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. Verse 15, and I will put enmity. The word means hatred. What does the word mean, everyone? Hatred. hatred between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Friends, this verse, the, the meaning of this verse is not immediately apparent. We, mean, we, we need to go back through it and see it again. Notice verse 15. God is speaking to the serpent. Who is God speaking to, everyone? The serpent. And he says, I will put enmity. Hatred between you and the woman. Why would he say something like that? Because, friends, at that moment, it appeared as though the woman had a new best bud. And that was the serpent. They were loyal to one another. They were attached to one another. And they were committed to one another. And so Jesus, God comes into that garden and says, I'll put enmity, hatred between you two. Where now there is friendship and amicability, I will make hatred and enmity. Now notice what it goes on to say, this enmity will bruise your head. The word is actually crush. That enmity will crush your head. But you, that enmity, will bruise the heel. What is being foretold here? Friends, this is the very first, the earliest reference in the Bible to the cross. To the what word did I say? to the cross, God here foretells that the natural affinity that Saint, pardon me, that Adam and Eve now had for Satan will one day be dissolved and crushed when the enmity comes. Who is that enmity? It is Christ on the cross who alone can create in the carnal heart of man an antipathy toward the things of Satan. So friends, number one, that, that victory was declared in Eden. In effect, I like to put it this way. When I'm trying to teach these things to my boys, I'm trying to make the Bible more simple. And I can't use these words that I sometimes use with you. And so I say to my boy, I say, Landon, what God here said to the devil is effectively you'll get beat up by a girl. <laughs> Amen? Amen? That's what he said. I'm going to put enmity between you and, and the woman and you're going to get beat up by her. Friends, here, the victory was not yet achieved. The victory was not even begun yet, but the victory was announced in Eden. From the days of Eden, it appeared as though Satan had won the war. What God is saying, you may have won the day, but the battle and the war will eventually be mine. The victory was declared in Eden. The victory number two of the stages was begun in the earthly ministry of Jesus. Go with me to Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11, the victory begun in Eden, or pardon me, declared in Eden, was begun in the earthly ministry of Jesus. I'm in Luke chapter 11 and I'm reading in verse 14. What verse are we in, everyone? 14, Luke 11, 14, the Bible says, And as he was casting out demons, and it, he was casting out a demon and it was mute. So it was when the demon had gone out, that, gone out that the mute spoke and the multitudes marveled. But some of them said, Ha! He casts out demons by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. Others testing him sought from him a sign from heaven. 
But he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, Every kingdom that is divided against itself is brought to desolation. A house divided against a house falls. If Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? Because you say, I cast out demons by Beelzebub. And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But if I cast out demons with the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man fully armed guards his own palace, his goods are in peace. Notice verse 22. But when a stronger than he comes upon him and overcomes him, he takes from him all his armor in which he had trusted. He divides his spoils. What's Jesus saying here? Jesus is saying what Satan has claimed as his, I am reclaiming as mine. Satan has had this earth under lock and key and I am coming back and I am I am plucking back what I claim as my own in the earthly ministry of Jesus. He was healing the blind, raising the dead. He was causing the paralytic to stand up. He was taking back what Satan had claimed as his own. The victory was beginning in the earthly ministry of Jesus. In fact, we find this no more clearly than in Luke chapter 13. Note that with me very quickly. In Luke chapter 13, we find a remarkable story beginning in verse 10. Luke 13 and verse 10. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bent over and could no way raise herself up. But when Jesus saw her, he called to her and he said, Woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. And he laid his hands on her and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. Friends, let me make a quick note here. It is just like the devil to make you crooked and bend you over and just like God to straighten you up. Amen. Amen. Verse 14, but the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. And he said to the crowd, there are six days on which men ought to work. Therefore, come and be healed on them and not on the Sabbath day. Notice verse 15, the Lord then answered and said to them, hypocrite, does not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or his donkey from the stall and lead it to water it? All of those verses, verses were read to set the context for verse 16. Notice with me verse 16. So ought not this woman being a daughter of Abraham, a daughter of who everyone? Abraham, whom Satan has bound. Who had bound her? Satan has bound. Think of it. For 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath. Jesus does not accept any responsibility or culpability with the woman's infirmity and sickness. He says, the devil bowed her over and I straightened her up. Amen. 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 Friends, the picture here is one of Jesus. And I have this picture in my fertile imagination. And Jesus is just going like this. And he's walking and reclaiming the very territory, the very people, the very cities, the very villages, the very landscape that Satan had claimed as his own. This victory was beginning in the earthly ministry of Jesus. Amen. Amen? Are you with me on that? And notice this. Number one, the victory begins or was declared in Eden. The victory was begun in the earthly ministry of Jesus. And hallelujah, number three, the victory of Christ over Satan was achieved on the cross. Amen. Let me show you just one verse to that effect. And we're going to talk more about this on Sunday. But notice with me John chapter 12. John, what chapter are we going to? John chapter 12. And notice with me verse 32. John chapter 12 and verse 32. Actually, we'll begin in verse 31 and then we will move to verse 32. John 12, 31, Jesus says, now. What word does he say, everyone? Now. What does now mean? Now. It means now. That's easy, right? I should write a dictionary. Now means now. It doesn't mean past tense and it doesn't mean future tense. Now is right now. Notice what he says. Now is the judgment of this world. Notice the word again. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. Who's the ruler of this world? To whom is he referring? He's referring to Satan. He uses that term three, th three times, by the way, to refer to Satan. The prince of this world, the prince of this world, the prince of this world. And notice what Jesus says. He says, now the prince of this world is cast out. Now, for those of you who are thinking, you would notice that we have already come across this very same language in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 9. He was cast out. He was cast out. He was cast out. And that's what the entire sermon on Sunday is about. But notice with me just one thing. Jesus says two times, now is the judgment of this world. Now is the ruler of this world cast out. And we might reasonably ask the question, when is now? And you read verse 32. Jesus says, and I, if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all peoples to myself. What is he referring to when he says, if I'm lifted up from the earth, I will draw all peoples to myself? To what is he referring? The cross. So notice what Jesus says. In the immediate context of the cross, Satan was cast out and defeated. Say amen if that makes sense. Now, friends, note that carefully. 
In fact, I just cannot resist. You're right there in John chapter 12. Notice with me John chapter 14. Very quickly, John chapter 14. I'm counting on your dexterous fingers to get there quickly. John 14 in verse 30. Jesus says, I will no longer talk with you for the ruler of this world is coming and he has nothing in me. He's cast out. He's judged. What can he do? Notice John chapter 16, the same, verse 11. John 16 and verse 11, of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. Three times Jesus says this almost cryptic phrase here, the ruler of this world is judged, he's judged, he's cast out. Now, in each instance, the casting out of Satan is in the context, the immediate context of the cross of Jesus Christ. Now let me read to you a powerful passage of Scripture taken from the writings of the Apostle Paul. Colossians 2.15. Notice this verse of Scripture very carefully. It says, And the hostile princes and rulers he shook off from himself and boldly displayed them as his conquest. The word is trophies, when by the cross he triumphed over them. Friends, the picture here, I, I wish I had time to go into the etymology of the, of the word here that he uh, displayed them as his conquest. The word there in the Greek, if you look it up in a lexicon, is, is, is the same word that would be used when one army would defeat another army and they would take that king and they would strip him naked and sometimes they'd poke his eyes out and they would lead him humiliated, defeated and naked through the streets. That's the word that is here employed. It says that on the cross, where everyone? By the cross. He triumphed over who? Over these princes and principalities and powers, namely Satan himself. Friends, Satan was humiliated on the cross. Amen. Amen? He thought he gained the victory. But just as he thought he had Jesus where he wanted him, he, he bore his chest only to receive whoosh, the stroke of death. Friends, the victory was announced in Eden. The victory was begun in the earthly ministry of Jesus. And according to Jesus himself, the victory was achieved on the cross. Hallelujah, though, number four, number four, the victory was proclaimed in the resurrection. Amen? Amen. Let's go to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, and the apostle Peter is preaching. Who's preaching? Peter's preaching. Notice with me in Acts chapter 2. We could read all of Acts 2 if time allowed, but we're just going to read a few verses here in Acts chapter 2. It's the day of Pentecost. Peter is preaching his heart out, and we'll pick it up in verse 22. Acts 2 and verse 22. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determinate purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands and have crucified and put to death. What's he saying in verse 23? What he's saying in verse 23 is, you did it, but God ordained it. Verse 24, whom God raised up. Can you say amen? amen? Whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. Verse 25, for David says concerning him, and Peter does something remarkable here. Peter begins to quote from the Psalms. And in the Psalms, the, the, the traditional interpretation of the rabbis, the rabbinical interpretation of the day, was that when, when David recited these words, when David wrote these words, he was talking about himself. But Peter here does something remarkable. He interprets these psalms against the backdrop of the messianic identity and resurrection of Jesus. And he says he was not talking about himself. He was talking about Jesus. Notice it here, beginning in verse 25. I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope, for you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. The word means decay. Verse 28, for you have made known to me the ways of life. You will, make, you will make me full of joy in your presence. And then he says in verse 29, men and brethren, let me freely speak to you of the patriarch David. I like that. Friends, let me just tell you about David. That's what he's saying. That he is both dead and what? Buried. Dead and buried and his tomb is with us today. You see what he's saying? You go to the tomb of David. Go in there and, and exhume his body and you will find he is still in there. He wasn't writing about himself when the Spirit of God inspired him to write these words in Psalms. He was writing about Jesus. Notice verse 30. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. Who would he raise up, everyone? The Christ. He foreseeing this spoke concerning the resurrection of 
the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. And friends, we could read the whole thing. Verse 32, Jesus, this Jesus God has raised up of whom we are all witnesses. What is Peter preaching on the day of Pentecost? What's the whole point of his sermon? The resurrection. He's preaching the resurrection over and over again. He just keeps revisiting that theme and revisiting that theme. He says, you crucified him. You put him in the tomb, but God raised him up. He raised him up. He raised him up. Why? Because through the resurrection, friends, the victory of Christ over death and sin and Satan was proclaimed. And friends, as we discussed the other evening, if, if Jesus can go into the cross and, or into the tomb and then walk back out, then you and I can follow him into the tomb if the Lord allows and wills, and you and I can follow him right back out. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Death will not have the last laugh. And friends, let me speak to you. Let me speak to you very quickly and very, very candidly. The other day, Jason and I, we went and visited a dear friend of ours, a dear friend who at this very moment is in a bed in his house who is dying of metastatic bone cancer. A Christian man, a godly man who has given his life for the preaching of the gospel. A man named Dan Collins, a powerful evangelist. Not powerful in his own right, he would detest me even suggesting that, but powerful through the Spirit of God speaking through him. He was converted from a life of debauchery and depravity. He had gone all the way that way, and he's come all the way back. And if you ever want to meet somebody that's wild for the Lord Jesus, Dan Collins is the man. He said, oh, Pastor Asherick is wild. Friends, I'm nothing compared to this man. Amen. We went and we visited with him. And a man who used to be so strong and robust, his muscles practically burst out of his shirt. He's in his hospital bed and he's frail and he's withering away in his emaciated condition. But I tell you, the devil has not touched his face. He still glows. And as we sat down, Jason and I went over to encourage him. We're going to go give the old man some encouragement. He'd love me saying that, by the way. The old man. We're going to go give him some encouragement, give him some inspiration. Friends, we went to encourage and we came away encouraged. We went to inspire, and we came away inspired. Why? Because here's a man on his deathbed, staring death right in the face, looking the devil right in the eye, and he has no fear because Jesus has already been there. Amen. 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 Friends, that's the beauty of the resurrection, is that if Jesus went in and came out, then you and I, if God wills, go in, and he'll take us out. Amen. Friends, that's the glory of the resurrection. Death has no more power. Sin has no more grip. And yet we spend our lives, oh, I'm going to say this, and yet we spend time looking and enjoying the, the beauties, the so-called beauties and the sweetnesses of sin. Friends, sin brings about death. Sin is the very thing that put Jesus on the cross. Sin is not funny. Amen. Amen. And you turn on a sitcom and you laugh at it, and if it's sin, it's not funny. The Bible says in Proverbs 14, 9, fools make a mock at sin. Friends, listen to me very carefully. I urge upon you, if you want to have confidence as you face death, if you want to be like Brother Dan Collins, staring Satan and death right in the face with confidence, knowing that you will go in and come out, you must, what word did I say? Must, must through the power of the Spirit, begin to develop a detestation, that is a hate for sin. Amen. Sin cannot be enjoyable to you and you think you're going to come following Jesus out of the tomb? No! Friends, sin must be that thing which we hate. What did Jesus say there? What did Jesus say in, in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15? And I will put an affinity between thee and the woman? No, no, no. He said, I'll put enmity between thee and the woman. You will hate the things you used to love and love the things you used to hate. Amen. 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 Jason and I today just read an article as we were traveling up to Lansing and I was thinking about that article and it's a, it's a story from Ephesians or a story from Acts when the Ephesians, Paul went in there and he preached the gospel. And they had their worship of Diana. And oh, they loved to worship Diana. But when Paul preached the gospel, they saw that their worship of, of Diana was nothing more than idolatry and magic and sorcery. And the Bible says that they took those books and they burned them. What did they do, friends? They burned the books. Now, what do you have in your life that needs to be burned? What are you holding on to? Friends, you got some videos in your house that need to be burned? Go burn them. Amen? Amen. You've got some things in your house that need to be burned? Go burn them. Friends, we need to come all the way out. Amen? And here's the glory. Not in your strength. You have no strength. But the strength of Christ is made perfect in your pathetic weakness. Friends, as you cling to the victory already gained on your behalf, Jesus has already defeated Satan. He is a defeated foe. He's a whipped dog. Amen? Amen. 
You can't beat up Satan on your own. You just trust in the victory already gained for you. And you go through your closets and through your refrigerator and through your entertainment. You go through your house and you take out all the magic books and throw them away. Amen. Are you with me now? Friends, the victory was declared declared in the resurrection. And if you want to have confidence going into that tomb, friends, you need to be living like that today. Are you with me? Amen. Friends, the victory was proclaimed in the resurrection and the victory is continued in the... What is that word? The victory is continued in the church. Go with me in your Bible to Acts chapter 26. Acts what chapter are we going to? Chapter 26. The Apostle Paul is retelling his testimony... And as he tells his testimony, he tells of the story when he was riding on his high horse to Damascus. And the Lord came and interrupted him. And in Acts chapter 26, and I'm reading now in verse 14, And when he had fallen to the ground, and I heard a voice speaking to me and saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the pricks. Verse 16, So I said, Who are you, Lord? Verse 15 continues, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Verse 16, But rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness. Let me stop on those two words. To make him a what, everyone? A minister and a witness. And let me tell you something. The Apostle Paul was not some super saint. In fact, he was a super persecutor. And Christ called him to be a minister and a witness. And every single person that becomes a devoted follower of the Lord Jesus Christ also is called to be a minister and a witness. There is no such thing as a Christian who doesn't share. I like the way my good friend Dr. Samuel Pippen puts it. If you're not a missionary, you're a mission field. Amen? Friends, if you're not out sharing, if you're not out being a minister and a witness, then somebody needs to minister and witness to you. He says, I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness, both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will yet reveal to you. Verse 17, he says it right here. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you. Why? Why are you sending me to the Gentiles, Jesus? Let me tell you in verse 18. To open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of what, everyone? Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Notice that the transition from darkness to light and from Satan to God, that Paul would be instrumental in helping people to make that transition. Amen? Amen. Friends, Jesus doesn't save us so that we can sit in our lazy boy and be saved. He saves us so we can be ministers and witness and show forth the praises of him who's called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Amen. Why would it be that God would involve the church? Friends, because the victory that was gained by Christ on the cross, proclaimed in the resurrection, must now be continued in the church. And that's why you have these great hymns, a legacy of great hymns like, Onward, Christian, what? Soldiers. Marching as to what? You ever seen people march to war? They don't do it in a slovenly manner, some going this way, some going that way. They march with synchronicity. They march with power. They march with conviction. Amen? Not a ragtag bunch of motley crew, each one going their own way. No, 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 friends. We are unified in Christ. Black man, white man, male, female, you name it, unified in Jesus. Why? To show forth the praises of Him who called us out of darkness into marvelous light, to go tell the victory is achieved, the victory is proclaimed. Amen. In the church. Friends, God calls you to be a witness of what Jesus has done on the cross. Do your neighbors know what Jesus did on the cross? Somebody better tell them, friends. Amen? Amen? And if you don't do it, the stones will cry out. Now let us continue as we go to our last point. The victory was continued in the church and it will be concluded after the 1,000 years. And oh, friends, the devil's going to take a long vacation, an eternal one. And I'm in Revelation chapter 20. Last verse. Revelation chapter 20 and I'm reading in verse 7. We began in Genesis and we have traced this great war, this great conflict all the way through the pages of Scripture. And it concludes in Revelation chapter 20, beginning in verse 7. Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them to battle, uh, to the battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and did what, everyone? 
devour them. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake and fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. The devil will be destroyed. Can you say amen? amen. The instigator of the rebellion will finally be destroyed and you can be destroyed with him if you don't repent. Amen. 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 Trust in Jesus and what He has done for you. So notice it here, friends, the six stages of victory. It was declared in Eden. It was begun in the earthly ministry of Jesus. It was achieved on the cross. It's a victory already gained for you. All you need to do is live in the victory. Amen. You don't need to go out and flex your muscles to the devil. He'd love for you to think it's your power that gets you the victory. You just trust in the victory that He's already gained. Proclaimed in the resurrection, continued in the church as ministers and witnesses, and concluded after the 1,000 years. Friends, in Revelation chapter 19, Jesus is depicted as rising, riding into battle, victorious on a white stallion. I put to you today this question. It is time to decide, friends. And my question for you is, whose side are you on? We have traced this cosmic conflict, this cosmic battle, not only through Revelation 12, which is the distillation of the conflict. It is the chapter more than any other chapter that distills that conflict down. But we've traced it through the whole Bible. And we have seen the six phases, the six stages. And I've got some news for you. You already know the outcome. You know who wins. So why align yourself, why side yourself with Satan? He's going to be defeated. Amen. Amen. Friends, align yourself with Jesus. Stand by on the cross. Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. Now, I want you to stand to your feet if you want to cling to that cross. Stand up with me, won't you? Say, I'm on that. I want to be on Jesus' team. I want to be on the winning team. Everybody should be standing, friends. Nobody wants to be a loser, amen? You want to be winners? You want to be winners for Jesus? Friends, you can win with Jesus.